John chapter 8, and I begin reading verse number 31. John chapter number 8, beginning at verse number 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They, said, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth forever. Therefore, if the Son, excuse me, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the privilege to gather in your house, grateful for the blessings of the day that you've given us. We ask that you'll open our hearts that our minds will be receptive, Lord, that we'll be sensitive to the leadership of your Spirit, that all that we do and say will be uplifting to the name of Jesus. For the prayer requests, those having physical issues, we ask for your grace and your mercy, we ask for the wisdom of the doctors. Lord, for those having difficulties in other areas, we ask for your guidance. Use us this morning and forgive me where I fail. For Christ's sake I pray. Amen. Freedom. The great illusion which we live in. Well, what exactly do you mean? Freedom is a state of exemption from the power or control of another. Liberty, exemption from slavery, servitude, or confinement. Freedom is personal, civil, political, and religious. We understand that this is an illusion, right? Freedom can be taken away at any time. When our found, we call them our founding fathers, 54 men who got together, and decided to draft a document that would declare that they are, that this nation would be free from the oppression of the king. They decided that they would not agree to a monarchy but that every man would be would have a voice in his own decisions and his own government and praise God that we live in a republic we have a right to vote and I impress upon you use that right to vote to say in what way our government whether it be local state or federal what way our government goes and does we are free and I say to those who protest our government and protest our nation first of all why don't you just leave <laughs> but listen we live in a nation where you're allowed to do that we don't live in a nation where a picture of some woman standing in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square as they got ready to disperse the crowd. A government that does not care what you want, how you want, they will tell you what you want. They try their best to gauge how a person thinks 
But I want us to understand when they put, uh, pinned their name to that document, 54 names of that document, they became wanted men. And eventually, every one of them would be killed in England's effort to suppress. But freedom is something that every individual aspires. Even young people, when they reach a certain age, like 13, want to say that I'm free. I'm a grown-up. Oh, are you really? Well, pack your bags and get out there and work and see how free you really are. Freedom is an illusion, isn't it? But I want to talk about real freedom. Real freedom. Jesus said, uh, recorded in verse 32, If the truth, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall, not may, could, possibly, shall set you free. Remember Pilate when he said, what is truth? That's a politician's answer there. But truth is conformity to fact or reality exact accordance with that which is or has been or shall be. Jesus said in John 17 and verse 17, Thy word is truth. The Lord is not going, did not give us a book with half truths did not give us a book where there's all kinds of speculation. Folks, he gave us the exact truth of who we are, where we're going, and our choice in the matter. Why are we here? Are we not here to bring glory to the Almighty? When the devil faces truth, he wants to corrupt it and change it. Is that not why in the garden he said, hath the Lord said? Did he really say that? And then he comes around and gives him an absolute flat out lie. That's not true because he knows that if you partake, partake of that fruit you'll be like him. Isn't that funny? Instead of having a relationship with his maker, Adam chose to destroy that relationship and the, and the parameters of that relationship by his disobedience. The devil is so good about lies. He wraps them in pretty packages. He decorates it with truth. But in reality, when you investigate it a little more deeply, you will find it's a lie. There's a thing called the social gospel. The gospel that teaches people that you are basically good. And that if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, heaven will be your home. That's a lie. What did Paul write about men being good? There is none good. No, not one. Jesus would tell us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You're not going to get to heaven no other way than by Jesus Christ. You're not going to know 
precisely and exactly and accurately what you need to do in order to be eligible for heaven except by the truth of God's Word and that truth is in Jesus, isn't it? And you're not going to find life, spirit life, other than in Christ Jesus, as I usually do. I emphasize the word, the way, the truth, the life, that definite article that tells us that it is not an optional type situation. There is only one way to heaven, there's only one truth, and there's only one life, and all of that is found in Jesus, isn't it? Amen. Let's turn to John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. And the Word, Logos, the living Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. People don't like truth nowadays. Okay. We just don't like truth. Merchants will try to make truth a little more palatable because people don't like truth. Notice verse number 15. John bear witness of him and cried saying, This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And he is, and of his fullness have all we received grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I remember a day when preachers would preach about hell that your fingers would get warm. I remember a day when preachers would stand and tell people exactly what their condition was and is and not too short on the words either. But nowadays, we have churches who are more concerned about programs, more concerned about letting people come to church in whatever they happen to be wearing, as long as it's decent. But the truth of the matter is, we need to understand that when we step into the presence of the Almighty, we need to dress like it. And we need to be prepared to receive it. We need to have a Bible in our hand so that we read what God has to say. Numbers 23, you know, God's not a man that He should lie. <laughs> He's not a man that he should lie. Folks, we don't have to worry about God saying something that's not going to happen. That two-edged sword, you understand, telling us of our fate without Christ, telling us our home with Christ, that two-edged sword, telling us the devil is going to have his way in this world, but he will be defeated, he will be locked away, and Christ will reign for a thousand years. Folks, these truths that we hold so dear gives us great and wonderful, wonderful joy in our heart. I'll take a moment and we'll turn to Titus. The book of Titus.
Titus chapter number 1 to this young pastor of the, uh, in the town of Crete. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the not acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son after a common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord and our and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. The truth is in Jesus, isn't it? Okay. Now you people try to disguise it, they try to change it. They try to say, well, People cannot really handle the truth, so we will tr slowly try to get them to attend and then gradually reveal truth to them. That never has worked. Okay? But the truth will make you free. Knowing the truth will make you free. In our text reading in verse 34 and 35, we have Jesus answered them, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. The servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Freedom from sin. Let's go through it. What is sin? Sin's the breaking of God's law. James 1 4. What is the result of sin? Death. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And by the way, that's spiritual death, isn't it? And that sin that is passed to all of us has put us in bondage. Now, this bondage is defined as slavery or involuntary servitude, captive imprisonment, restraint of a person's liberty by compulsion. We don't think of ourselves as chained. We live in a free nation, don't we? But there are folk out there that are involved in things that, are, that they are chained, they are in bondage, they are trapped into a system that will not release them. The only person that can release them from that bondage is Jesus Christ Himself. Bondage. Doesn't matter what name you put on it, because only freedom comes in Christ, right? But bondage. Let's turn to Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. Verse number 12. Excuse me, verse number 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey the lust thereof. Notice that word reign there? That is the same word as a king reigns over his people, over his territory, issues government regulations. Reign over a reign in your mortal bodies. 
Verse 13, neither yield yourselves members of or members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Amen? Amen. Well, wait a minute now. We are sinners by nature and by practice. That's true. But do we not still have a choice? Now this word here, neither yield ye, verse 13, your members. That word yield means to give in to, right? Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of, un, of righteousness unto God. It is a matter of choice. It is true that we are going to be tempted every day, multiple times through the day. It is true the devil knows the kinks in our armor. He knows the weakness spots that we have and he wants to exploit those but it's still a choice because we have conquered sin in Jesus Christ. Still a choice. Don't let it get a hold of you because as the old expression is that is a slippery slope that will cause great pain and sadness in your life. Let's continue reading. Verse number 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Don't you know that you're serving somebody? Wouldn't it be better to serve the Lord? And that which is good. If you yield yourselves, you become his servants. And the idea of a saved person being in servitude to the devil is just about too much for us, isn't it? But there are men standing in pulpits this morning that are the servants of ungodliness and sin. They are preaching falsehood. They enjoy the lifestyle that they have built for themselves on the backs of those to whom they are speaking. And I want you to know today that one day they will stand in judgment and if they are not saved, we know where they're headed. And if they are saved, they will give an account to the Almighty for what they have done. Now, read a little bit further. But God be thanked, verse seventeen, that you that ye have that ye were the servants of sin, but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, but ye became the servants of righteousness. We are free. True freedom is not found in this world. It's a, it is an illusion because somebody wants to put you in bondage. If you buy something and you decide to buy it on credit, you're signing that document that you're going to make those monthly payments. You become servants to those payments and to the lender. If you decide that you want to do something with your life that is not God honoring and God pleasing, you could become a servant to that thing. I've heard people say, well, I can quit any time I want to. That's not true. That's not true. Maybe they need a good dose of want to. Right? I can change any time. Frank and I can walk away from the dessert table whenever we want to. 
You just don't want to. Okay? It's a choice, isn't it? To become a slave to something. People don't realize that drugs, alcohol, this junk that they're selling in our town is not helping people. It's putting them in bondage. Amen. They are slave to that stuff. They can't get away from it. I get those phone calls. Does your church help people with rent or utilities? I feel like saying, well, instead of going downtown, why don't you use that money that you're spending for that outrageous amount of whatever that stuff is and putting it toward rent and food? <laughs> that makes sense? Okay. Or come up to me and say, we, I need financial help. Sell that $1,000 cell phone and that would be a good spot to start. I'm, I know I'm mean. I realize that. They become a servant to that thing. We have a generation that doesn't know what it's like to be without a cell phone. We have a, when we, and we're trapped to those things. Bless your heart. We are tied to those things. We could mention many others. But here is the bottom line. Listen carefully to me, please. When something you're doing hinders your attendance to the Lord's house, it needs to be changed. That's right. That's right. Because if that thing becomes more important in God, then there's something wrong. We're tied to it. But we have been set free. There is not a single thing out there that we cannot walk away from. David stood on that porch and looked down. He could have walked away. That's right. Should have walked away. But he stood there, looked down, and then he decided he wanted her. Well, as that affair developed, now we're going to have to do something because she's with child. I'll just cover it up. What are you going to cover up from God, by the way? <laughs> I'll just cover it up. I'll just get her husband killed and then I'll take her to wife and then nobody will be the wiser. But when Nathan stood in front of him and said, Thou art the man. You had my servant Uriah killed and you're going to pay a serious price. That child will not survive and you will have war the rest of your life and you will not build the temple of God. Wow. Pretty strong stuff, isn't it? He could have walked away. Okay. Bondage is a real thing. Okay. A real, real thing. Whatever name you want to put to it, it's a real thing and it can be very harmful. But if anything gets between you and God, there's something wrong there. Okay. So what is the conclusion here? Down to verse number 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, amen, you'll be free indeed. As the missionary who was arrested and thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, we will put him in isolation. He can't talk to anybody. He'll slowly go crazy because of being isolated for so long. And yet they found him singing praises to God. Now figure that out, will you? <laughs> okay. Singing praises to God. couple missionaries in the Bible that were thrown in jail for preaching. And as a matter of fact, the next morning they were, the people, the accusers were hoping they'd be killed. Silenced permanently. And at midnight they were singing praises to God. <laughs> at 
at midnight. Well, because of their praises, because of their faith, because they saw beyond their chains, a man came in, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the church at Philippi was born. And when they came to get ready to take him, Paul would stand and say, I am a Roman citizen. What are you doing to me? Oh, wow. Get out of here. Leave. Leave now. Take your friend with you. Because they knew if word got to Rome that there would be soldiers coming and they would not take prisoners. If you have accosted a Roman citizen, you have opened up yourself to some serious danger. Get out of here. Citizenus Romanus. But that church in Philippi, as he would tell them, you know what I was? You know what I walked away from? That I might win Christ. Freedom. Every, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you are free. You hear me? You are free. Sin does not, will not touch you because the blood that has been applied. When we do sin and out of fellowship with God, is it not the blood of Christ that forgives us and is applied to our lives and cleanses us from all sin? We are free. The day of judgment will not be the one where they're opening the book. Opening the books. And opening another book which is called the book of life. And look for your name there. It's not here. I didn't know. Yes, you did. We're not going to be there, praise God. But we're going to be at the one when we walk before Him. And He's going to review how we have served Him in the body. What have you done for Jesus? He's going to review. When I step before Him, He's going to give me that stern look because I have been responsible for preaching His Word and the truth of His Word. I am responsible for your souls. And beloved, He's going to look at me and say, Hey, my judgment will be more severe. Bob's judgment will be more severe because we, and if you are a teacher, your judgment's going to be more severe because we are responsible to share the truth of God's Word. But that judgment's not for us with the books and the book of life. But when we stand, and you know that reviewing stand, that Bema seat, it's also known as the mercy seat. You know, praise God for His mercy. And we will not be refused heaven because of that judgment. We will give an account. How have you served? What have you done? What, how have you dedicated your life? To the one who feels like they've not done very much at all. It's not the amount, is it? It is the faithfulness that matters. Matthew 25, 21. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Paul would write in Galatians chapter, one, uh, chapter 5, he would say, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. The Galatian brethren were trying to keep the law, bring the law back, revive the principles of the law. 
which was not even for them, was it? Paul is telling them, listen, you're free. You're free. They too could have that great big statue. Bring us your people, your sick. And that statue that is a representation of liberty that the world sees when they approach the harbor. Freedom. In World War II, the men were coming home on ships. They entered the harbor and saw the Statue of Liberty. And they all stood at attention and saluted. Do we not have a great nation? And the icing on the cake, my beloved, is the fact that Jesus hath made us free. So we are free indeed, aren't we? Praise God. We are free. We can stand when the world is suffering, when the world doesn't know where to turn. And eventually, when, and from time to time, when someone says, my life is such a mess, listen, I know somebody that can fix that. <laughs> Not only will he fix it, but he'll give you peace. He'll give you presence. He'll give you guidance. And in those things, you will find freedom. That begs the question, if all that comes in Jesus, what else do we really need? What else do we really need? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Well, of course I do, Pastor. Well, I, I cannot look into a person's heart. I have, do not have that ability. But I can tell you that there are certain signs, there are certain fruits that a child of God will produce. Have you ever heard a song or even heard a sermon that touched your heart so deeply? I was driving home from work on a terrible day at work. And I've told you this before, but Jerry uh, Erickson Tata came on singing a song. And I said, Lord, forgive me. I can walk. I can move about. And this poor woman sits in a wheelchair and has to have that thing to where she can put her mouth on it to move the chair around. Has to be fed. And she can stand there and say how good God is. Aren't we ashamed? We should be. Because I tell you, there are folk who can barely get around and yet they're praising God. And we can get around pretty good. What is our number, dear sister? 530. 530. Let's stand together, please. We have two verses, if I may.